Sunderland against Spurs. Sunderland are the team in the stripes. Your commentator, Jeff Thomas, pictures from Tyne Tees. At Perryman. There's Knowles pushing it up for Pierce and Greaves. Turning on that ball so quickly, Jimmy Greaves. And oh, and it was who got the long boot to it. Keslop. Todd. And Sunderland defending well. And another cheer for Cecil Owen. Billy Hughes, a good pass that time from the big fellow. And Hughes trapping it well. Harris waiting back for it. There's Gordon Harris. And Baker on the left-hand side. And Baker now. Tewitt calling for it. Hughes looking for it. And Park. And Hughes! A great goal, Billy Hughes! Oh, what a goal, Billy Hughes! Mallory. Gilzean having a quick look over his shoulder for the positioning of Jimmy Greaves. And a lot depends on Jimmy Greaves. Knowles again. This one looking for Greaves' head. And Perryman now with a chance. Morgan. And not, yes, called offside, Morgan. It looked as though for a moment the linesman flag, linesman's flag was not going up and Morgan might be onside, but it looked quite clearly as though he was offside. There's Roger Morgan. Park, Stewart, Baker. And now the Sun second Making half. grounds to beat his opposite number and opposite skipper. And there's a chance for Baker. Baker has the chance. And almost an own goal as well. Well, Joe Baker nearly could managed to control that ball fell to the ground hurt himself and Joe Kinnear to cap it all almost put it into his own net Joe Knowles to Steve Perryman Perryman moving in with it and Greaves and uh, Hughes it was who saw the danger and overran that one very quickly took it with him Baker and Joe Baker not got the pace there but here's the opportunity now for Baker Collins it was who slipped. Baker gets it through now. And Dow saw Knowles at the 11th hour. And a penalty. The penalty for Stewart having been tripped. Well, it looked from here as, that, as though that must be the reason. And Gordon Harris, Roker Park's resident penalty spot man. Harris, who scored three goals so far this year. And it's there. Sunderland two, Spurs nil. Knowles' pass not going very far at all, but getting the second bite, Roger Morton, Morgan. And Irwin still retreating. Irwin just coming back as Chivers goes in with it. And Martin Chivers now, Gilzean moving into the area, Greaves there, Morgan, a great goal! A lovely goal, Roger Morgan! So a fine goal then by Roger Morgan, but not good enough, because Spurs go down by two goals to one up at Sunderland. time for some more action and it comes from Luton and it includes another fine goal by young Malcolm McDonald. I'm sure you remember the hat-trick he scored uh, three weeks or so ago at Sheffield Wednesday but now it's Luton against Sunderland and Luton are in white. Keen again now Slough with Moore here Ryan off Todd corner it is so Ryan beginning to move about and finding uh, wherever he goes uh, time to trouble this defence. Second corner of the game. And Dan Givens there on the near post causing a bit of trouble to Cecil Irwin. Nichols gone up. Malcolm McDonald off the post, off the bar. What a shot. 
Irwin. Kerr in a good position here, with Baker coming into the middle. Baker, it's there. Well, that was well worked by these two small forwards. The first league goal that Luton have conceded this season. Court. Porterfield staying with him. Now Mike Keane. Mick McGiven getting it away, picked up by Hoy. Ryan, support from Hoy, but uh, Ryan courageously going past and getting some stick as a result. And a tackle way above the socks. And that's what the referee thinks of it. Three and a half minutes before half time. John Ryan, Keane in the middle as well. Gibbons, oh, what a save! Now Mike Keane to McDonald. Now the second half. Uh, John Ryan with Busby on his right. This is Busby and Jimmy Ryan moving in the middle with Gibbons, McDonald, and Hoy. With Busby. Tricky ball well. And Mike Keane coming back so well to control that. And a brilliant ball to Busby, with McDonald coming in on it. But he's brought it the wrong way. Brought it back into the defence. But Ryan makes it a good And who else but McDonald? Seven and a half minutes left. More. Hoy. Irwin. Bobby Kerr. Pass now. Good control to Tark. Finding uh, Baker. Neat pass to Porterfield. Porterfield. Not quite sharp enough on his control. And a corner, says the referee. He must have gone off Ryan, although. Quite a few people disputing that fact. Oh, there's a free kick there. Well, that one's a mystery. So it's Kerr and Hughes over the far side of the box. Baker on the ball with Harvey behind him if he wants to use him. And Park square of him uh, on the face of the penalty area. There it is from Kerr! What a goal! And a well, a strange looking free kick there, but it doesn't look too much wrong with Luton, although that was defeat for them, their first defeat at home. They're still third in the table. come to a bit more action and it features now the thrust towards the first division of Millwall down in South London. Last week they were thrashed at Preston. Uh, yesterday they also had plenty of trouble when they went to Sunderland. Still plenty of goals as well as Jeff Thomas takes up the commentary. The pictures come from Tyne Tees television in black and white and Millwall in the white shirts. And a good run there by Billy Hughes number 10. Just getting up to that goal area and winning the goal kick. Good run there by Hughes. Winning the corner kick, that. Porterfield, number six. Number seven, Chambers taking the short one to Malone. Looking for Watson. Here's his chance. Well, Dave Watson uh, was looking for his 11th goal then since joining Sunderland. 
and he won't get much uh, closer than that. And the keeper really reflex action. Hughes just had lifted that foot ready to shoot when uh, Dorney got ahead to it. So a few moments of excitement here in the Millwall penalty area. Kerr's throw, plenty of distance. Watson, not his head, almost in. It's in, put in by Watson. I think it, or was it Pitt? Yes, it's Richie Pitt. Well, that pressure of Sunderland's on that Millwall goal eventually had to pay off. And Richie Pitt it was who scored his third goal of the season. And obviously very happy with his return to the Roker side after injury, scoring that goal. obvious by the play particularly the way things are happening in the second half that both teams are aware of it this is Kerr toured at the back as it comes off it's over the line so it is being signaled a Sunderland ball I saw the linesman actually change his flag there when he looked at the referee the referee was in a much stronger position to see it so Kerr going back for his Long throw. Nico Watson. Back to Kerner. One of the players still down. There's Hughes. It's in. Off Hughes. It's Kitchener who's down. Bolland down in the foreground. And Millwall depleted as Hughes scores his second goal in two matches. And I can see Kitchener now just crawling back to his feet as the trainer comes on to him. But let's have a look at that a goal again as it comes across. And there's Hughes to put it in the back of the net. And uh, no doubt about it, Brian King completely beaten as Billy Hughes scores his sixth goal of the season and gives Sunderland a lead of two goals to nil. There's Martin Harvey headed on by Smithhurst, back by Bridges, Posse going in. And well taken by the youngster. Forster taking that very well and cleanly. But a free kick. And Cripps protesting vehemently to the referee. Number three is Cripps. Indirect free kick, as you can see, inside the area. That's the decision of Mr Hackney. So that's how close the Sunderland wall is. Five of them in it at the moment. And Forster really like a cat on a hot tin roof on his line there. Coleman on that far post. Every player but two, but three, in fact, in the penalty area. I have never seen a penalty area more crowded, more congested. They're all there now, except two Millwall players in the centre circle. Every player in the Sunderland side is back. Bolland, it's in, and what a goal. He really hit that perfectly, it was touched across to him and he really got behind it. And Forster had no chance in the world as that went over the top of the wall and into that top corner. A good game of football, this really, between two good sides. Fossey, good header, and a beautiful save. A really class save there from young Forster. Plucked it out of the air. A good header from Fossey. And he gets his free kick there because Cripps went in and tackled him whilst he had possession unfairly in Mr. Hackney's opinion. But what a save by Forster. Watson trapping it well. For Tewitt now. Kerr's up in the area and Hughes on the far side. Chambers number seven looking for Hughes. Hughes going to take him on. Good ball from Hughes. Chance, it's there. It's Kerr. Well, Billy Hughes had success written all over that move as he pulled it back to find little Kerr scoring his sixth goal of the season and Sunderland's third of today. And here it is as Hughes takes possession and pulls it back for Kerr, who makes absolutely no mistake from well inside the area to beat Brian King for the third time and score his sixth goal of the season. In the corner, to be taken by Bolland. And look at the welter of players up there for this corner. Cripps appealing for something, perhaps for hands, that might have bounced off one of the Sunderland defenders. But all he's got. And is now there's less than five minutes left. 
It's number three. That's him right in the thick of things. Doug Alder, the substitute, taking this corner with his left foot. And Forster taking it third bite. No, it's in. It's a goal. Scored there by Derek Smethurst, I think. Yes, that's him. Derek Smethurst, number 10, who pushed it through. It came off the hands of one of the Sunderland players. But that makes the scoreline much more interesting now from a Millwall point of view. With Derek Smithers scoring what I think is his second goal of the season. As he forced that one through that defensive melee of players and into the back of the net. Smithers making good ground to lift it in. And a good save there by Forster as he just got a foot to it. But what a hot shot there from the former Chelsea player. Because that one would have snuck inside there if the goalkeeper hadn't got a foot to it. Good work again by Smethurst. And uh, he really is being a very valuable player indeed for the London side. So Bolland with the corner. There it is. They've got the equaliser. And it's Posse, I think, who put it in. Yes, Derek Posse, the equalising scorer. So 3-3 then, with five of those goals coming in the second half. So you can't really uh, complain about that. That ball going in there from Posse's head to make it 3-3, with, for the second time in this match, two goals being scored in the period of just two minutes. So a really wonderful comeback there by Millwall for a valuable point. First we go to the picturesque Manor Ground in Oxford for the entry of Sunderland. And it's nice to see the cup holders down in our territory again. Names and faces, of course, that became famous overnight almost after that Wembley victory over Leeds United. Now strong favourites to follow that up by getting promotion to the First Division. So the crowd generously give them a warm welcome. Now as we move, though, to the home team, that's Oxford United, who've made a poor start. And they've in fact conceded seven goals in their last two games. And believe it or not, they've scored only one goal all season. So that's a setup then for the second division battle between Oxford United and Sunderland. The pitch, in fact, looking in very good condition uh, with a downhill slope away from this camera here. In spite of that dismal record, the Oxford manager Jerry Summer shows a great deal of faith in his side, and there have been no radical changes. As for Sunderland, they field exactly the 11 that won at Wembley last May, and they are able to do so now because their number four, Mickey Horswell, has served a three-match suspension and gets his first game of the season. With a chance for Kerr to uh, play the short one to Malone, and now for Kerr to cross one into that Oxford penalty area. Oh, and a magnificent goal! What a tremendous goal by Dennis Stewart! Well, that is a goal of the season. A truly acrobatic and amazing goal by Dennis Stewart for Sunderland with a game no more than three minutes old. As the ball came across from Bobby Kerr, he caught it acrobatically on the turn and on the volley, and that gave Burton no chance. What a tremendous goal. Bob Stoker in the middle in his shirt sleeves, wearing a very familiar world of sport tie, I notice. And now back with Jimmy Montgomery. Always remembered, of course, for those most marvellous saves against Leeds United in the cup final. Clark winning that valuable ball in the air, but he could only send it off to uh, Dennis Stewart, and away goes Stewart again. Really is on song today, Stewart, across the face of that Oxford goal once more. Kerr trying to turn it back, and Shuka misled by the bounce of the ball. It comes through to Horsewell, hit first time, and turn on again, and again offside. But they are looking so sharp at the moment, Sunderland. Playing down the slope. Horsewell playing his first game of the season. He was suspended for three matches. So 
There's the free kill, the uh, corner. And a great header, saved magnificently on the line by Montgomery from Cassidy. Hughes getting it again, and Horsville getting it away. Kerr. Oh, there's a good ball there, and Tewitt is after it. Oh, and he tried to turn it in, and Burton has miscued, and Burton was handling that inside the area. Now, the referee is having a sharp word with Vic Hallam about something. Hallam was showing a certain amount of dissent there about that decision. Hughes, Porterfield, and a long way back to Montgomery. Montgomery really hobbling quite badly from that knock he had earlier in the half. Cassidy has gone right back. Tall man's gone in and little Bobby Kerr stays outside the area, telling him where they want the uh, corner. And will it go? Watson is there. Watson turning it away across the face of that Oxford goal. Shuka watching it as it went. Well, certainly Watson went up there to get a header in. He hardly thought he would have got a shot in. But on the turn, he very nearly found the inside of that uh, far post. Nicely played there by Alot to Lucas, but he's put his full back under a bit of pressure. Watson getting the foot in there. Now Hallam versus Roberts, and Roberts is pulling back on Hallam, and it's got to be a free kick, although I'm bound to say it looked to me as though uh, Hallam was offside in the first place. But no play on, says the referee, and there's the chip now for Tewitt. Can he make another one? Horswell hitting one, and a good shot it was. Not quite as tense for Bob Stoker, of course, at Wembley, but he seems to uh, expend as much nervous energy during a game as any of his players. As you can see, and there was a relief on his face when that final whistle went, with the only goal of the game scored right at the start, and a beautiful one it was too, by Dennis Stewart. And so Sunderland take away from Oxford two very valuable points indeed, and a win to take them to the European Cup Winners' Cup in Hungary on Wednesday. So we have a final score line here at Oxford this afternoon that reads Oxford United nil, Sunderland 1. And indeed, perhaps the only really memorable moment of that game was the goal that won it. And Dennis Stewart was telling me afterwards that it's the best goal he's scored in years, and I'm not surprised at that. And it certainly wouldn't have gone unnoticed by Brian Clough, because, of course, Derby County meets Sunderland in the next round of the League Cup. What did you think of the goal, first of all, Brian? This is an absolutely beautiful goal, Brian. Um, I don't know how many goals Dennis Stewart scores, but as you've said, he can't have scored many better than this. Mm. In fact, it was, a, it was a fairly firm cross by Kerr, wasn't it? It was a beautiful cross, and it was an early ball in actual fact, and this is what made the goal. He takes it up the right wing, he doesn't waste any time, he gets it in, he allows Stewart time to volley it in, and before he was tightly marked, he got his shot in. I didn't think the goalkeeper was in the best of positions, he actually gets his fingers to it here, and I believe if it had been on the near post to start off with, he might have saved it. Mm. But still, an, an exceptionally good goal. But Watson, you've mentioned there, Dave Watson, a lot of people see him as the main contender for the England place, held by Roy McFarland at the moment. You probably see more of McFarland than anybody. How do you weigh up the two, in fact? Well, Dave Watson's developed remarkably well over the last 18 months. Uh, he, had a he had a magnificent cup final. This has set him on the path where people are saying he is a candidate. There are a lot of uh, worse centre-halves in the Football League. But is he a serious candidate, do you think? I think he's a serious candidate, yes, because, uh, uh, you know, Alves had problems finding somebody to uh, push McFarland. Mm. He's number one by far, obviously. But I think Dave Watson could come into the reckoning this season. Yeah. Well, he showed some very good touches yesterday, which I know have impressed you in what you've seen in the last half hour or so. Uh, particularly uh, his good control on the ground, which yes. we see straight away. He needs all these things to be a good centre-half. Here he is in his own penalty area, not showing any uh, signs of nerves, beats an on-rushing uh, Oxford forward, takes it away, looks up and lays a beautiful ball along the right wing with the outside of his foot and starts off a sudden attack. We, we'll give you another example of it here. It's a long ball from inside the Oxford half, 
It goes over several defenders. I believe he shouts for the ball there, which is always a good sign. He controls it on his chest. He resists a, a pretty firm challenge. He beats another forward coming in with the ball and just lays it away to his left back. Nice, cool, calm and collected. We're now going to show you where he has to be at his best because this is where he earns his cash in the penalty area. He's tightly marked his centre forward. He gets a, a tackle in. He recovers remarkably well. And he slips it away to one of his colleagues and there they go again, all the danger. Uh, is averted. And now the one thing that every centre half must have to make him a good player. Here we have a corner, he gets up under pressure and he doesn't just head the ball, it doesn't plop down, he powers this ball out and it goes some 10, 15, 25 yards. Magnificent header. And we'll give you another better example in actual fact here. Ball's laid into the penalty area, there you see him, nice and poised and balanced, up he goes and he sticks it right on Billy Hughes' chest and away Sunderland go on another attack. You meet them in the League Cup, what do you think? Well, I hope he doesn't play as well as that uh, when we play him. We won't put too many on his head, obviously, and we'll try and uh, put him under a bit more pressure. I think he had a lot of time there. Yeah. Um, we'll stick Roger Davies against him and he might have a bit of trouble with Roger. Do you see Sunderland as first division material for next season? I think uh, they're, they're as good a bet as anybody. Uh, they've started off very well. He's not having too good a time at home, in actual fact, but that will come. Uh, it's important to win away matches. in South London, the home of Charlton Athletic, and even on this grey, miserable and wet afternoon, a good crowd that reflects both the appearance of Sunderland and the recent good form shown by Charlton. But Charlton know it's a real test of their quality today when they face the second division leaders so close to promotion the last couple of years. So there's the setting for what promises to be a good game. Uh, and first, let's catch up on the two teams. Uh, Charlton Athletic unchanged. The only detail for manager Andy Nelson uh, to fill is the substitute spot, and that goes to Bob Curtis. As for Sunderland, who come here having lost only two of their last ten games, they tour unchanged, with 19-year-old Mick Henderson keeping his place at number three. The crowd, taking every good vantage point they possibly can, almost filling, uh, or half filling at any rate, this massive Charlton Athletic Stadium, 22,000 strong. Hunt, Peacock, Flanagan. Oh, Malone slipped badly now. Still with Flanagan. Oh, and Montgomery had to take the safe way out, with both Hales and Powell onto him. So it's a corner again then to uh, Charlton Athletic. <laughs> Powell and Peacock between and deciding who will take it. Robson back to help out. Powell, loading it towards the near post. And the ball moving a fair bit in the air, causing Henderson to put it behind. Young Mick Henderson, only 19, playing his third game for Sunderland. Powell floating it in again. And a backward header. It might come through to Hales yet. Bowman almost got in there too. Giles might get in there as well. Kicked off the line by Hallam. Well, Charlton so near to going into the lead with four minutes gone. A tremendous scramble there as it came out to Giles and was kicked off the line by Vic Hull. Billy Hughes. One fair challenge by Mark Penfold. And I think Hughes is in a bit of trouble. Oh, 
Well, that's a formality that number eight's coming off, of course. Wave there by Bob Stoker, the Sunderland manager. And Mel Holden, the, uh, the man they got from Preston, will replace Billy Hughes. Fair to Towers to Robson. Nice touch there again by Robson, this time for Holden in the middle space. Lining up his shot and catching Peacock on the heels. Flanagan away. Here's after it. And might still get it. Well, this could be the one for Charlton. It's straight at Montgomery. Oh! And he cannoned over the Sunderland player as he tried to get the rebound over Bobby Monker. The first shot saved by Montgomery. And as he grabbed it, a leap by Hales over Monker. They're sitting in the front row of the director's box, the Charlton chairman, Mr Glickston, and on the right of him, the old Charlton manager and trainer, Jimmy Trotter, who's not been to this ground now for 13 years. Now below. Giles getting that one away. Tires played back from Malone. Bit high again towards Vic Hallam, and he got the header in there. Robson might be in. Yes! Holding the scorer. Well, the uh, bad news for Charlton began when Hallam won that ball in the air. When Robson typically was fast onto it. He flicked it through, it hadn't crossed the line though when Holden came in to make absolutely sure. And away goes Sunderland to Vic Hallam. Leaving it for Towers. Good ball there by Towers. What a good ball there for Porterfield. Holden in the middle, played nicely for him and Holden completely missed it. Oh, and Kerr almost got it. And Chuck finally grabbed it right at the last. All beginning with a superb ball though from Tony Towers. Porterfield playing it on, Holden missing what looked to be a relatively simple chance, and then Tut grabbing it just before it got to Cook. Towers. What a delicate chip there by Towers for Kerr. Robson played nicely there for Kerr. Time to size this one up, and Hallam was right in there. Very nearly made it number two. And a real question mark there against the Charlton defence. Nice one too there, play between Robson and Kerr. And Hallam first to it, but put it wide. One of the qualities, I think, of Charlton's play over the last year or two under manager Andy Nelson is even when they're playing badly, they do keep putting their heads down and coming forward, trying to force errors out of opponents. That's what they've got to do this afternoon now, even though they're not playing particularly well, but it's Towers at the moment for Sunderland. Henderson making a good break for them down the left. Robson didn't quite get the touch there. And here goes Powell now for Charlton. Not offside, he's all right. So Flanagan now with a chance for Charlton Athletic. And yes, it's there by Hales. Well, that break came out of nothing. And suddenly, Flanagan was clear all the way, just on side, the linesman kept his flag down. And when he got and faced Montgomery, it looked as though he'd lost his chance. But in fact, he put it into the path of Hales, who was able to slide it in. Yes, a corner. So, Bobby Kerr will take the corner again for Sunderland. Robson in that six-yard area, and Holden! Oh, that was a mistake in the Charlton defence, just look at the smiling Sunderland faces there. As that corner from Bobby Kerr came curling in once more, Holden the substitute was there first, a glancing header from a sharp angle, and Sunderland are back in the lead. Robson, Holden, Kerr, 
Played in the space there for Robson, and he very nearly brought off an excellent goal there for Sunderland. Well thought out. Had a much better second half after being almost outplayed in the first half, Sunderland. Tony Towers, they've had the best player on the field, but there's a throw, and it might not be all over yet. Oh, and there's a bit of a bust up on the far side there as the Sunderland players there go after Hales, and there's trouble there as the referee gets in between them. There was clearly an incident off the ball there, the Sunderland players got up now. I think it was Tony Towers, no, it was Henderson who was the Sunderland player involved. And Hales, the man goes into the book. And I believe he's been sent off. Yes, Hales has been sent off by referee Jack Taylor. It can only be for kicking. Played here for Malone. Now Peacock. Well, that was a silly ball for Malone to give away. And if Charlton have got time to spring an attack, they might yet find something. Warman playing it through to Bowman. And the whistle has gone, and it's two points for Sunderland, who keep their place at the top of the second division. And a disappointment for Chardon in front of this big crowd. Number six, uh, David Young, will be more disappointed than most as a former Sunderland player. Mel Holden, the number 12, the substitute for Sunderland, scoring both their goals. With Derek Hales having uh, got the equaliser for Charlton, early in the second half. So we have a full-time score here at the Valley. Charlton 1, Sunderland 2. And Billy Hughes, incidentally, had a suspected cracked ankle bone, but he was able to travel back with the Sunderland team. But the incident, of course, that most people were talking about at the end was the sending off of Derek Hales. And manager Andy Nelson has been very honest and forthright about it. Uh, let's deal with it first of all, Andy. I think you're quoted as saying that Derek deserved it. If you kick somebody, you have to go. Well, this is true, Brian, you know, you have to have the right set of standards on a football field, you have to back the referee entirely, and clearly you can't go about kicking players. So what was your attitude with Derek when, uh, when you realised that this had happened? Uh, well, I didn't know uh, after the game that he got sent off for kicking a player because the ball was quite a long way away from the incident, and I missed it like I think quite a lot of people. I asked Derek, immediately I got in the dressing room and he said that he kicked a player, you know, it gets what he deserves. Well, let's give you the chance to see it then. Um, and it happened, as we know, in the very last minute of the game, on the far side of the field. And as this throw-in uh, is taken, a good long throw there, Derek Hales, in fact, jumps here on the back of Henderson. <coughs> now, forget the ball, just watch those two players who are now falling to the ground, and you'll see how Derek Hales, as he goes round to the back there, kicks Henderson, not once, but probably twice there. And the referee superbly placed Jack Taylor to go and do what he has to do. What's your reaction now? You've seen it, uh, Andy. Well, you know, this is the first time that I've seen it, Brian. It's completely clear the referee's in an excellent position. Dirk kicked the lad without any shadow of doubt. Uh, the only thing we can say is that the referee was 100% right. And uh, we ought to say at this particular time that the manner in which he sent Dirk Howells off was excellent. Tell me that. What do you, what do you mean by well, that? Well, uh, there was no... There was no antics whatsoever. He knew clearly what he was going to do. He took him away close to the, the tunnel, uh, told him he was on his way without wagging a finger and pointing his hand and everything else, and the boy was in the bath. Now, as a manager, do you discipline Derek Hales when you uh, go to the ground tomorrow? Well, no, we don't, not, not for these sort of things. We discipline players for dissent. You can't go on forever. Derek Hales is disciplined himself by the simple fact that he will miss a game, the next game, uh, he's got a very good chance now of missing two because he'll reach 20 points with another caution. Mm. Uh, so clearly he's going to miss, going to have a very good chance of missing three games anyway. Professional players get paid uh, their bonuses and appearance money uh, and probably comes to probably half of their salary. So Dirk Howes uh, really has disciplined himself and uh, I, think, I think basically I feel sorry for the lad to some extent because uh, he's been a model professional during my time at Charlton. Uh, yesterday he cracked. And, uh, you know, I think if anybody regrets it, it's Derek Howes.
Our next match features Sunderland in the relegation game of the day against West Ham. Both sides, in fact, have hit a bit of form. West Ham have won their last three games. Sunderland, indeed, have scored ten times in their last two. 35,000 fans at Roker Park. The pictures from Tyne Tees Television, the commentators Ken Wollstoneholm, West Ham are in white. Holden was pulled down then by Bill Green, the former Carlisle player. More shocked than anything else for Holden. It's all right again. Bolton, to, no. It's not Bolton, it's going to be Ashurst with the free kick. John Radford, the former Arsenal with England star, being beaten by Gary Rowell. And a chance there, surely, and it's the first goal, yes, and a beautiful goal scored by Holden. And a mistake by Radford. Only two minutes of the game. Radford being caught in possession by Gary Rowell and the West Ham defence nowhere as Rowell makes progress, puts it into the middle and there was Mel Holden and Sunderland in the lead. Ten goals they've scored in the last two matches. Bolton. And Days losing out on it. Now Raul trying to take his time. Beaten by Bill Green. Now back comes Sutherland. Raul again and he's got the second. And that really was well worked. Kevin Arnott, the man pulling it back from the byline. And the number 11, Gary Rowell, who made the first goal, was there, although the ball was put into the net by a West Ham defender. There was no doubt at all. The ball was always on the way there. And suddenly knocking the ball about with a great deal of confidence. Hanging in the air, dropping well for Lee. Now to Kerr. And off bombs for a corner kick. And organising the defence is Billy Bonds. A quarter of an hour to go, and I don't think Bonds or anybody else could be very satisfied with the way the West Ham defence has been playing. Bobby Kerr, the Sunderland captain, to take the quarter kick. Day missing that one. And it's a goal! Yes, scored very cheekily by the number nine, Mel Holden. It was a, a weak clearance by Day. Mel Holden has got the goal. A weak clearance by Day was running back, and there was Mel Holden all on his own. Nobody within yards of him. And Holden just nodded it into the empty net. Green got a good back pass, and it's a corner kick. There have been an awful lot of question marks against this West Ham defence. Quickly taken the corner. Lee. Waldron. And the back field pick. And it was almost there. Oh, that would have been the cheekiest goal of the season if that back field pick by Mel Holden and Donny. He's looking for Radford. And Radford not again forward. But too far forward. One sees the skills of a player like Trevor Brooking, one wonders what he'd do if he was in a really good side. Oh, bad mistake, now straight to Kerr, and that's four. And really, can you imagine? 
can you imagine a team in the first division? No wonder Mervyn Day looks absolutely dejected. The ball being allowed to travel to Bobby Kerr. All on his own. Right in the middle of the goal. The time of absolute the open goal. Is 52 minutes. Bolton. Using to be shaken off it. Throw in. And it's another one. And it's Gary Rowell who makes it five. Neatly nodded down to him by Lee. And Rowell just coming in at full pace. Hits the ball. Hard, no, true. Into the back of the net. And Bonds way over there in the sunshine. And that's for nobody in particular, but Waldron, the man getting it clear. And that's onside. Now then, Bob Lee with a chance to get number six. Has he? Yes, he has. And I have never seen anything so wide open as this West Ham defence. The ball just pushed forward by Doherty. And the whole of the West Ham team expecting an offside decision. There was no chance of that. Bob Lee keeping his cool. Went on. Picked it into the back of the net. What do you make of that? Uh, I suppose it's dangerous to draw any hard and fast conclusions from a few moments of highlights like that, but I'd be very surprised if there weren't one or two very busy inquests at Upton Park in the next few days. Clearly a shattering blow to the hopes and confidence of West Ham as they struggle to get out of trouble. Let's look at the bottom of the first division and you'll see what trouble they're in. In fact, you'll see also that Sunderland, with that little burst of form, are not exactly playing themselves out of trouble, but they've given themselves a bit of hope. Immediately beneath them, the London pair, Spurs and West Ham, and what is ominous from their point of view is that the two clubs immediately below them, Bristol City and Derby County, as you can see, have both got two games in hand. Clearly it's going to be a difficult last part of the season uh, for West Ham and for Spurs. Oh, and Pearson put through by Greenhoff. Jones is after it. Pearson shot go! Spurs against Sunderland at White Hart Lane, where a 38,000 crowd was looking for an afternoon of good cheer. So as Spurs push towards the first division, this is the team that looks for a valuable win today. Now without Don McAllister, who is serving a one-match suspension after being sent off last week at Brighton. Jerry Armstrong, that striker-turned-defender, fills the gap at the centre of the defence. Otherwise, it's a Tottenham side that's had a good run, largely unhampered by a serious injury, although they have lost two of their last three and it's a bad time to start faltering like that. As for Sunderland, no prizes for them this season, and their recent run with only one defeat in nine games came to a halt on Tuesday night when they were again in London, and this time lost 3-1 at Millwall. Bobby Kerr, still their best-known player, and the sole survivor from those heady days of 1973 at Wembley. So there we go, Sunderland in blue shirts and white shorts. Spurs in white shirts, attacking the goal to our right. At the start of a really critical week for Tottenham, three games left, today's at home in Widwick against Hull and away to Southampton next Saturday. And really at this precise moment, disregarding results in other games, Spurs want four points for promotion. And they could well do with two of them today, and Peter Taylor going in! And a goal! In 28 seconds, Spurs go into the lead. What relief and joy and sorrow for Barry Siddle in the Sunderland goal. He's not yet touched the ball. And uh, for Spurs 1-0, it came in high. Peter Taylor was the man who nicked in. So it's 
Henderson. Kerr. Rostron. Perriman there with him. Doherty turning it in to Gregoire. And Rao. And Rao! 1-1. One, one. Well, it was a mistake by Jerry Armstrong. The stand-in uh, defender for Don McAllister. And uh, as that came in, the mistake was there by Armstrong and Gary Rao. Hits it into the roof of the net to bring Sunderland back on level terms. Spurs one, Sunderland one. Here's Bobby Kerr, laid back this time for Henderson. There's another chip, and again, there's just a little too much on it, but Rostam will get it with support here from Bolton. And Sunderland still playing a very relaxed game of football. Doherty playing it now for Henderson. Kerr available on the right, chipped in again towards Raul. But the whistle had gone for offside before that ball thudded against the Tottenham crossbar. And again, the first pass was wildly off the mark. He's got a chance to make another one. Duncan played back for Pratt again, played in for Jones. There are plenty of them up. Taylor's there as well. The little chip going in. Oh, and he hit the post with it. Well, terrible luck there for Peter Taylor. That's one of his stocking trades, those lovely little curling shots. Siddle desperate to get across his goal. The ball hitting the post. Taylor coming up alongside him to support, and so is Hoddle. Here's Hoddle. Jones playing it back again for Hoddle. Will he let one go this time? No, it was Raul who got in the way, and Rostrin who can bring it out. Gregoire and Lee are up for him, and coming up fast here is Mick Doherty. What a good break by him. As a cross towards Bob Lee on the far side, the header there, and it's into the net by Lee, and Spurs are behind. That's 17 and a half minutes into the second half. And Bob Lee has put them into the lead, Sunderland. A great run-up by Mick Doherty. And his cross to Lee on the far side, who had three or four yards to himself. And although Barry Dane's got a hand to it, he couldn't stop it going into the net with Gregoire in very close attendance. So, Spurs, after a start that produced a goal in 28 seconds, now find themselves a goal behind. And is this slide of theirs at this disastrous time in the season, so near to the end when it looks so sure for them for so long, is that slide going to continue? Sunderland have already got their substitute, Sean Elliott, changed. And Hoddle bringing it in now. And Duncan on the turn, and Siddle with the save. As though there might have been an infringement there before the ball got to Duncan. When it did get to him, uh, it didn't really have a shot with a lot of conviction about it. As Siddle went down. Away to Lee. Well, if Spurs don't watch it, they could be caught out again. They've got a lot of men forward and they've got to bring them back. And there's Kerr onside. Linesman kept his flag down. Played it again. And another goal by Lee. 3-1. Well, that's a disastrous moment again for Tottenham. They'd taken a chance by putting Perryman right up front. And they were badly caught out. Bobby Kerr onside, linesman kept his flag down, a low cross coming in. And uh, Lee put it away with ease. And Spurs requiring two goals for a point. Naylor. Taylor. That's a good cross. And Perriman's right in there. Oh, and he's hit the post. Lovely cross again by Peter Taylor. Perriman on the far side. Controlled it well. And this angle looked as though he hit a post. Follow again. And now Naylor. It comes again. Jones with a header, and Duncan got the touch. Well, we could be in for a finish. Eight minutes to go. 
Then a long cross came in. It was touched there, first of all, and then secondly, Duncan just put that little nick in there. Enough to put it wide of Siddle. Spurs two, Sunderland three. Three minutes of time added on, and now it is all over. It's a victory for Sunderland. So a full-time score then at White Hart Lane, Spurs 2, Sunderland 3. It was apparent as early as that first Sunderland goal after 16 minutes, the Spurs were in a bit of trouble. When the ball's lifted in here to young Roland Gregoire, just look, as a miscontrol there, but just look as he gets it back again, the room that he's given, the time to turn, surrounded by five Tottenham players, and he flicks it in, and Raoul just gets a touch with his head. And it's where here that Jerry Armstrong, not a defender, of course, makes his error. But look at the number nine there, completely unmarked also inside that Tottenham penalty area. And there was another example in that first half where Spurs were giving Sunderland so much room on the edge of the box. There's Will Froster. Now, how on earth can you allow a forward that amount of room on the edge of a penalty area? And it was as well for Tottenham on that occasion that uh, Rostron miscontrolled it and Hoddle was able to get in there and snuff out the danger. But when they went 2-1 down, they instantly put Steve Perryman up. Uh, to me, they overreacted a little bit there because they left themselves so loose with just three men at the back. And indeed, it was from this particular move uh, that Sunderland got the killer third goal. Remember, when they went 2-1 up, Sunderland, there were still some 25 minutes left. And Spurs really had panicked at that point. And now with just three men at the back who got caught very square here. We'll stop this in a moment. There they are, look, absolutely square, just those three men in defence, and they were very vulnerable indeed. Lee, in fact, a lovely pass through here for Bobby Kerr. What an inspiration he is still to Sunderland. He was onside, he could easily get in behind the defenders. A nice little touch inside, a good piece of finishing by Bob Lee, and Spurs then were in real, real trouble. <laughs> Now we're going to move on to our second game, and for that, plenty of goals as we go to the far northeast, where Sunderland, on a good run at the moment, were at home to Bristol Rovers, who are also having a good season. Tyne cameras were at the snowy Roker Park. The commentators, Kenneth Wollstoneholm, Sunderland are in the stripes. Endless racing onto that one, and that's done it. The referee takes one look at the linesman, but that's the break that Sunderland needed. The ball pushed down the middle, Entwistle raced onto it, took possession well, I thought he was going to make a pass, decided he'd shoot, and a fine shot right into the back of the net, the goalkeeper out of position. So, a throw to Bristol. It's been pretty poor service up to the two Bristol strikers. Chance for Entwistle again, straight down the middle, the defence completely square, wide open, and that's 2-0. And the goalkeeper with no chance then, Martin Thomas. Two goals then for Entwistle, with the Bristol defence square, open right down the middle. The ball up straight into the gap, Entwistle racing onto it, kept his footing, kept his head very, very well, and... Didn't panic, slotted the ball home, and it's now 2 0. Henry suffered from lack of inches then, and the ball runs loose to Henderson. Neatly taken by Roston, and Henderson once again. There's Wayne Entwistle gets Sutherland's first hat-trick of the season and the crowd rise to it. 
That really was a beautiful centre and entrances by the far post. Flushed in, let magnificently, hit the ball perfectly with his hand and gets his third goal. Great effort by Bob Lee. Raul going down the middle, calling for it. There's Raul, gets on the right side of the defender. Dave blocks that first effort, still with Raul. Entwistle. Oh, Lee bust. Yes. <laughs> well, he could almost, as they say in the old days, could have taken the lace out of the ball. But the credit for the goal was, first of all, to Raul, who lost the ball, regained possession, sent the centre across, and three goal Wayne Entwistle put it back in the middle, and Bob Lee all the time in the world to side put it home. So, 81 minutes, it's 4-0 for the Sun. Push a day on Entwistle. I think the kick was taken about 10 yards away from the spot where the offence took place. Buckley. To Lee. To Bolton. In comes in. Entwistle from the right. Oh, it's... Oh, you would hardly believe it. Gary Rowell at last has got his name on the score sheet. And again, the man who makes the pass inside was Wayne Entwistle. Bobbing up on the right to snap up the ball when Joe Bolton pushed the ball to him. And Entwistle, very calmly, put it in the middle and set up an easy goal for Gary Rowell with just three minutes left. 5-0. Well, that's a victory that puts Sunderland into fourth place in the second division table. Uh, eight goals they've scored in their last two games and still, of course, without a manager. Our next match today comes from the second division and Chelsea's visit yesterday to Sunderland. Now, Chelsea's successful run, of course, came to an end last week when they were beaten by Fulham. Now Jeff Hurst's men take on a team that many people tipped for promotion. The pictures come from Tyne Tees, the commentator Roger Thames, Chelsea in the dark strip. Four tight in the wall there. John Bumstead, the man, shielding the ball, I suspect. Three Sunderland men standing over it. Done. Through the wall, Whitworth. Whitworth again, and Chivers gets the important boot to that one. The referee has given an indirect free kick here, or possibly the foul on Steve Whitworth as his head went down to that ball, right on the edge of that six-yard box. Arnott's there, Dunn's there. Must be a short kick. Arnott, but it's not in. Dunn, locked on the line, and finally hacked clear. That was a golden opportunity for Sunderland there. It just ricocheted off the wall. We could have had some controversy there if that goal had been scored. So I don't think Chelsea would have been very happy about the free kick being awarded in such a dangerous position. Kick. Oh my word, that's in from Gary Johnson, and that was just oh so simple. Well, the free kick was from Gary Locke, and he slipped over as he took it, but it certainly didn't affect the direction of it. And Gary Johnson was underneath that one, and as simple as you like, he just nodded it over Barry Siddall and into the back of the net. Whitworth rather overstruck. Give it the one-two, here's Arnott. Gilbert. That ball nearly fell right for Rob Hindmarsh. Might still fall OK for Barry Dunn. Dunn 
can he turn it in? <laughs> Easy chance there for Kevin Arnott. Kevin Arnott, the scorer, but Barry Dunn, no mistake, the man who made it. Barry Dunn back in the side today after all that trouble in midweek. And that's the sort of skill he can produce. Good close control in tight situations. Over it came the cross, it eluded everybody, and there was Kevin Arnott almost on the goal line. The simplest of chances and the equaliser for Sunderland. Deep for Jeff Clark. Can't get a clean header at it. Finally, Ron Harris lashes it clear. Witness. Raul now. Gilbert in the middle, a chance for Gilbert. And he's taken it. Tim Gilbert gets number two. They both found themselves in space there, and Gary Raul had them all under control. Gilbert made the break. Raul slipped it through, and Gilbert kept his head and slipped the ball past Peter Barota. Sunderland take the lead. They lead 2 1. Eight minutes of the second half gone. Bumsted under that one. Hind Marsh again. Gilbert, but straight to Ian Britton. Oh, how did Siddle keep that one out? Emma there from Johnson, I think, came right off his feet as he was diving the wrong way. Of a breeze getting up here at Roker Park. Now here's Dunn. He wrote it well there. by Graham Wilkins, the shot from Rob Hindmarsh and Barota in the Chelsea goal, lucky to keep her to escape then on two occasions. But sadly that was the second successive defeat for Chelsea and of course tomorrow night Sunderland come to London to face West Ham in a League Cup replay at Upton Park. Sunderland with uh, Brian Robson who came off yesterday with a calf injury in that game uh, makes him very doubtful for the game tomorrow night. Meanwhile Alan Devonshire of West Ham came off during the victory for West Ham over Wrexham yesterday. He's had a virus infection during the week but manager John Lyle says that he expects Alan to be fit. Right, for our third game tonight, we go to Roker Park, where 33,000 greeted the return of Sunderland to the First Division. They were at home to Everton, who was so indifferent last season. Indeed, Gordon Lee is another manager who really needs a more successful season this time. The pictures are from Tyne T's television. The commentator is Roger Thames, Sunderland in stripes. as well. Arnott pushing the ball through, Cummings nearly got away from Gidman, Cummings could get away from him this time, and that's a penalty. No doubt about that one from the referee. Gidman committed the offence. It was Gidman who cleared it, but when it was got back in to stand Cummings, he turned it well and Gidman was struggling from that on in. And down went Cummings. And it'll be John Hawley who's going to take it. Jim McDonough, the man he faces. Hawley with a kick. That's it. 1 0 
to Sunderland. John Hawley the scorer from the penalty spot. No problems from the penalty spot. Calmly taken. Madonna went the right way, but there's no way you're going to stop them like that. This is Ratcliffe with the throw up the line. That's Allardyce with uh, well, the, it was Sharp who was penalised for backing into Allardyce as he did a basketball impersonation of a Fosbury flop over the top of him. The free kick is to Sunderland, which Kevin Arnott will take. Played up the line for Hawley, the goal scorer. He will have to turn Ratcliffe, which he does. He gets the cross in. Cummins, that's 2-0! at the back. Delighted fans now, some of them go two up. Allardyce there at the back of the box. And Cummins just nipped in and into the roof of the net. This is Ratcliffe. Well by Buckley, Hawley's with him. Hawley times his one correctly, has he done? Beat the offside trap, there's a chance here, surely, surely can he still do it? It's still on, oh, and finally McDonough jumps on it. Oh, that one surely was gift wrapped for John Hawley. He timed his run to perfection to beat the offside trap, and then it seemed to be the difficult thing to do. Well-timed run from Hawley, and he was clear with no one ahead of him. But then he just seemed to lose control as he tried to take it round McDonough. Steamrolled his way on a bit, but uh, it was all out of control from then on in. And McDonough delighted to pounce on it. Turn of speed from young Ratcliffe. Whitworth intercepts to concede the corner. Encouragement from the Sunderland skipper. McBride with the corner, driven across. Led by Hindmarch. It's fallen nicely. And Gray stopped that from Billy Wright by Chris Turner. Billy Wright certainly had the chance there as the ball fell to him. He was on his own there, trying to line it up, but he blasted it straight at Chris Turner. He pushed it back, and Allardyce was able to clear. Hartford to McBride. Sunderland need to live a little dangerously now. It was an excellent shot that from McBride back off the post. Nobody able to cash in on it. Right. Oh my word, that could be in it, it is. Oh my word, what a terrible moment for Billy Wright. Well, that's a classic case of misunderstanding between centre half goalkeeper. McDonough had come out and right just lofted it over his head and there was nothing McDonough could do. It just nestled in the back of the net. So, Alton with a tackle. It's a good ball from Hartford. East over the chance. Has he taken it? Yes, he has. Substitute. Peter Easto pulls one back for Everton will surely be no more than a consolation. It was a little bit of an action replay of Billy Wright's goal, but at the other end. The keeper out, and Easto read it correctly, and the toe to it, although Turner got a hand, he locked it over the neck and into the back of the net. 3-1 to Sunderland was the final score. Now let's move on to our second game, and it's Sunderland against Leeds United at Roker Park, the first away game for Alan Clark as manager of Leeds. The pictures come from Tyne T's television, the commentator's Roger Thames, Sunderland in stripes. Now it's the master himself, Eddie Gray. Not a very masterful pass there, read by Gary Rowell. And Sunderland looking to break forward now. Arnott has moved up into space on the right. A good first-time ball to Alan Brown. 
who tried to turn Trevor Cherry and was held by the lead skipper. Free kick to Sunderland. Just over 20 yards out from goal. And the Leeds wall lining up on the left-hand post as we look at it now. Directed by John Lukic. Elliot, oh, well hit, but straight into the pit of John Lukic's stomach. But that was a really solid strike at goal from Sean Elliott. Just looking to hit it through that gap, but although Flynn tried to charge it down, he still got the shot in and Lukic did well to save. Allardyce. And Brown, now he's got past Neil Firm. He had the pace then, can he square it? And Pop Robson! Scores for Sunderland, and that was a typical Pop Robson goal, lurking there in the penalty area, just waiting for the little chance to pop up. Good work, good work by Brown, and there was Robson, thank you very much. And a worrying little spell this for Leeds United. Brown now battling with Stevenson, and push down, surely yes. We've already had a crack at goal from Sean Elliott from a uh, free kick about this distance out. What will they try this time? Arnott in there, into the back of the box. Raoul, Robson, that should have been two and it might still be yet. Eddie Gray finally clearing it away. Oh, Pop Robson was lurking again there in that six yard box. But the ball just wouldn't fall for him, but it might fall for Stan Cummins now. And he's got past him. Cummins, lovely skill, Robson. It's there. Robson does it again. But what beautiful work from Stan Cummins. Look at that for a feint. But Robson's there. Spot of pushing. Leeds have uh, pushed forward Neil Firm had extra height but it's Hart who's run for it and got ahead of to it Graham that was close to say the least not the first time that uh, Arthur Graham has got a snapshot in like that one he was at that one quickly enough and uh, off the upright and away square now it's Eddie Gray Two for Hart, who's run into a good position. And we very nearly had uh, a similar sort of goal to the two that Pop Robson has already put away into that goal. Hart had definitely run well there, and uh, then the Leeds player got to that one first, and the opportunity was there. But it's Graham with the corner. Firm arriving from the back. Flynn. Oh, we've got a deflection from Derek Parlane. He was certainly quick to react from that one. Certainly, Brian Flynn uh, didn't intend the cross. He was looking for the shot. And uh, Parlane turned quickly and just got the header to it. Whitworth with the kick towards Alan Brown. Play on, says the referee, as Brown gets the cross in. Cherry is underneath it. Whitworth again. Allardyce, a little touch. Hurd is under pressure. Hart is under pressure. Arnott's looking to get it back, and he has done. Rowell, and it's in from Gary Rowell. And Gary Rowell's long, long wait for a goal has ended. It's 18 months since he got one. And no wonder he's delighted. Needed Kevin Arnott's skill to get the ball back into the middle. Raul came in and it got a little bit of a deflection off Lynn as well, I think. Whitworth now. 
Arnott teasing Robson. Cummins. Raul. Brown. Lukic needed all of his six feet four inches then to grab that one. Sunderland's play really flowing at the moment. Five minutes left in the match. 3-1 to Sunderland, the scoreline. Kevin Arnott. Cummins. 1-2. Back to him from Brown. Chisholm into space for Bolton. Arnott takes it up. Has to push it through for Cummins, who's made a good run. Uh, shoved out of it by Paul Hart, but Raoul has got the chance now. Beaten by Kevin Hurd. Went straight to Whitworth. There's no relief for Leeds yet. Alan Brown, chance to shoot. Oh, he's tucked that one away nicely. Took that one in his stride, Alan Brown, to rub salt in Leeds United's wounds. Kevin Arnott saw the gap, just touched it through there, and Brown sized it up on the move and put it out of the reach of John Lukic. And it finished a 4-1 win for Sunderland, and disappointment for the new Leeds manager, Alan Clark. Before the game, he said Leeds were going there to win. Afterwards, he refused to comment. We go briefly to the northeast for the goals in the game between Sunderland and Arsenal. Sunderland had four successive defeats behind them and brought back striker John Hawley for his first game in three months. Pictures from Tyne T's television, commentator Roger Thames, Sunderland in stripes. Arnott trying to slip it through to Bolton, a young crashing into the tackle, Bolton going forward. Hawley tries one. Oh, what a goal from Hawley! Unbelievable! What a return as well, he really whacked that one. Jennings can't have known what hit him. Here's Hawley now. Whack. Take that. Right in there. Jennings had no chance. Price with the corner. Stapleton at the near post. Headed off the line. Walford's header off the line by Whitworth. That was a close escape. But Arsenal still have it now. Price there, Stapleton there, Walford again, Turner's got it now. And Walford twice denied. Really, Steve Walford moved up to join the attack with telling effect there. And here's Cummins. And could we have an early goal here? Oh, that was close from Arnott, and Cummins was sniffing around as well. What a start to the second half that would have been. And Sunderland really meaning business right at the start of this second half with Cummins jinking his way forward. And Kevin Arnott finally trying to get the first time effort in which Jennings was down too quickly. Joe Bolton. Oh, that's a poor one, straight to Price and Stapleton's with him. But Dermot is in the middle. Price could be trying an effort himself. Oh, good effort, good save. Cook now, going to get away from Willie Young, Cook's on his own, what a goal this will be if he gets it, oh that deserved it so much, he did absolutely everything he could and more besides then, Cook, Cummins, Whitworth now, spare men in the middle, here's Arnott, Hawley's in the middle, has he delayed too long, Hawley still wants it but Arnott's still got it, Oh, beautifully done by Kevin Arnott. That really was sheer class. Well, everybody must have thought that Kevin Arnott held on to it too long, but he knew better. And he kept control, he looked up and he picked his spot and he just rolled that one in, cool as you like. 
So, 2-0 to Sunderland, and how does it look now at the top of the first division? Well, that draw between Ipswich and Liverpool has given Aston Villa the chance to go back on top tonight after their 3-0 victory over Birmingham City. Manchester United move up to fourth place on goal difference, despite being two down at one time against Stoke at Old Trafford. Uh, Everton move up to fifth, and Arsenal now drop to sixth with that 2-0 defeat at Sunderland. Welcome again to the big match. No beating about the bush, we have just one of yesterday's seven league matches for you that were played. But it is without doubt the best. An astonishing game between Manchester City and Sunderland. The pictures are from Granada Television. Let's join our commentator there, Martin Tyler. Stewart takes on his now customary job in midfield. City had slight worries only about right back Ray Ransom, who's not been well with a grumbling appendix. And also Trevor Francis, who's still not totally overcome a thigh strain. But John Bond is able to name an unchanged side. Alan Durban waited until one o'clock before giving up on Nickel. And Durban will also spend the weekend pondering over a deal that could bring Southampton's Dave Watson back to Roker Park. But it's Rob Hindmarch and Jeff Clark in the centre of today's defence, with Sean Elliott in midfield, where there's also a place for Gary Rowell. Skipper Ian Munro is unfit, so Nick Pickering switches to left back. And defender Joe Hinnigan plays a first game for two and a half months. He's been suffering with a pelvic strain. Bill Boyer in the sheepskin, the nearest end of the Manchester City bench. Ritchie. Now Pickering. He has impressed in possession. She's pass, finding Cummins. Again, Sunderland springing men forward. And Cummins used Hinnigan as a decoy. And Stan Cummins, a bolt from the blue. To illuminate what has been a fairly turgid first half, but a fine shot that beat Joe Corrigan to the wide. Francis. His persistence brings another corner. Seven City players in the Sunderland area. Kevin Bond is one. Gotcha. 
situation as it goes across to Francis now. Because this was the pass that tore Sutherland apart. Francis wasted no time, got his angles right. Richie, good control on the chest. First time pass from Cummins. And then from Buckley. All the time in the world for Kevin Bond, in fact, who knocked it back. And Ali McCoist put it wide with a whole goal gaping. And Marsh again. Nathan Elliott do the running. The rider timed his approach beautifully. Now the picture was being applauded by Tommy Hutchison, who provided the pass. It's aware of the ground that the rider had covered. can now take place. Hennigan comes off, and 17-year-old Barry Venison, who can play at the back or in midfield, gets into the action. And his first touch is a good one for Cummins. And Raoul! And Venison celebrates his part. What a substitution! Raoul gets the congratulations as the scorer. Here was Venison. In from Cummins. And Raoul swept it in. And there are seven minutes remaining. It's match for City 2, Sunderland 2. Reeves, blocked by Venison. Now Hartford. Bond and Francis stretching to try and make contact at the near post. forward here, one of whom is Cummins and McCoy. And here's Buckley, Someone sense there might be a winner in the offing here. Venison, and he's done it! The first goal in league football for Barry Venison. <laughs> Spectacular style. Coming on a 
substitute, he helped set up the equaliser. Corrigan totally beaten. And two minutes remain. Another look at the watch. And Sunderland's third win of the season in dramatic circumstances provided by Barry Venison. What a gesture of triumph. Coming on as substitute, playing a part in getting the equaliser from Gary Rao and then scoring the winner himself. This after Trevor Francis had scored twice at the start of the second half and seemed to have turned the game match the city's way. But it's Venison who gets the congratulations at the end of a real switchback of a match that finishes match the city two, Sunderland three. Switchback is right. It was a remarkable finish. I can't remember a more amazing substitution than that one that saw, as you remember, 17-year-old Barry Venison coming on with just nine minutes left. His first touch led to that equaliser. And then that superb winner with just three minutes remaining. Yet at lunchtime, young Barry was anything but happy. I felt down and disappointed. I thought I had a chance to play on the side. I didn't think it would be at right back because I knew Joe Henning was coming back. But I, I thought I might have a little chance to play in midfield. When I was left out, I was down, but I was pleased to be, you know, included in the squad, even, even at sub. And what were your thoughts when you were sitting on the bench there? I didn't think I would come on, to be honest, because I thought Joe was playing quite well, the team was doing pretty well, and then the boss just come down at 10 minutes, 50 minutes ago, he said, get warmed up. He thought Joe was a bit tired, and he said, just get warmed up and work yourself up and down the right wing. And they were your instructions, basically, yeah. to play wide on the right? Well, not wide on the right, but, you know, work up and down the right-hand side. So, and when I come on, I got a... Fit, my first touch, I just knocked it wide, and then the goal comes on that. And I come inside, and I never expected the ball straight away. So that left me confidence straight away for the last ten minutes. And then with two minutes to go, you scored the winning goal. We can uh, have a look at that one now. You can like, tell us a little bit about it. Well, the ball got crossed in. A big defender knocked it out. I think it was Bond. And Stan made a chance for it and I just gambled into the space. And I didn't place it, obviously, I just hit it. And Joe Curran got a touch and it just looped it in the top corner. Is that your first goal? First ever for the first team, yeah. I hope it's not my last. How do you feel about it, then? Oh, over the moon. I'm just getting my breath back now. What did the lads say to you afterwards? Oh, they were pleased. They were pleased for us. Did that really make your Christmas? Oh, uh, it's the best Christmas present I'll ever get. Indeed, quite a 17-year-old there, and I'm sure he will never forget this Christmas in a hurry. With the championship getting nearer to Anfield week by week, first division interest really concentrates on the European places available now and, of course, relegation. So Roker Park was undoubtedly one of the places to be today. Everton looking towards Europe, Sunderland hoping to stay in the first division. Everton in the blue shirts, the commentator is Roger Thames. Stevens looking to set Heath away. Atkins is there. Munro hooks it on. Still Everton come forward. Richardson. Stevens to Sheedy. Could work it wide on the left here to Bailey. And instead, it's Cliff who now finds Bailey. Johnson in the inside left channel. And Sharp. And that was definitely a chance he should have taken. He had to wait for the bounce to be right. But Sunderland had given him that yard or so of room in which to operate. Again, the cross played over the face of the Sunderland goal. And there he was unmarked. They all went for Andy King, and he poked that one too high. I mean, the speed saw him in there. And he's got the corner kick. I'm sure he'd settle for that. Sunderland pushed the big men forward. Worthington there at the near post, you can see. James now. Atkins is at the far post. Worthington off the line there. By Bailey. Sunderland still looking to turn on the pressure. Venison. And the tame shot there, finally. That was certainly Everton's closest call. And 
Menison out for Cummins, deciding to work the left-hand touchline now. And Munro. Flicked by James to Worthington. Back for James. Appeals there for the penalty against Bailey, and the referee gave it. And the Everton players gather round Colin Seal, the referee, to protest. Led by John Bailey, the culprit. Worthington and James looking to open the Everton defence there. And there was the handle. So it's Gary Rowell against Jim Arnold. And no trouble at all for Gary Rowell. Gary Rowell gives Sunderland the lead from the penalty spot. Kept it low, Arnold dived the wrong way. Bailey trying one. Well, John Bailey nearly atoned for his error straight away then. Certainly not lacking motivation this afternoon, John Bailey. Johnson. And laying the ball into the path of Adrian Heath. And sharp, and that's the equaliser. Well worked, well taken. Heath, a simple cross, and he really got up high there, Graham Sharp. Richardson won out, but Chisholm was there. Higgins, Andy King, and Gary Stevens. Shank away again through the middle. Sheedy, Sheedy again, what a magnificent strike from Kevin Sheedy, but he's disallowed it, disallowed it for offside. Sharp setting up the opportunity in the first place, the ball falling for Sheedy, got the one-two back off Nickel, and that was a magnificent strike, but the offside given. Heading for Sharp. <laughs> Stevens finds Andy King. Shudy has to chase for this one. Bailey is ever up there supporting. Comes inside for Heath and King. And Stevens. And Sharp and Andy King teeing it up. Oh, great shot. Well dealt with by Turner. They really worked that opening superbly, Everton. Controlling the passes. Sharp who finally laid off the ball for Andy King and Turner pitched that one away well Here comes the cross again and Turner came for it and I think it must have been King again so heavily involved in the action as ever who finally put the ball away for the goal kick to Sunderland James. Venison. Again, Everton determined in the tackle, but so too is Venison. Can't find a way through on his own. And finally, he uses Cummins. Nickel on the overlap. And behind for the corner kick. Jimmy Nickel. Doing the work of the ball boys. So Leighton James it will be who'll take the kick. The defenders clustered at the near post for the numbers eight and nine there, Raoul and Worthington. James with the corner kick. Raoul going for it. And Ralph gets it as well. Gary Raoul, second goal of the match. It's 2-1 now. Leighton James with the corner kick and Gary Rowell arriving there through the gap and a powerful header there.
and Gary Rowell, the leading goal scorer, really is on form at the moment. King, and King really went flying there, the challenge from Ian Munro, and King in some trouble it seems. Munro's name goes straight into the book, and I think they're calling for a stretcher. Howard Kendall, the Everton manager, out on the pitch. It was a sad sight, and any footballer has to go off on a stretcher and go to have a consoling word there with Andy King and Irvin Irvin still going Heath oh within a whisker there and Adrian Heath so desperately close to an injury time equaliser there well sorry about the sound interference there it was caused by gale force winds at Roker Park so 2-1 the final score. The Everton manager, Howard Kendall, quite pleased uh, with the way his side played. Although from their point of view, there were one or two very unfortunate incidents. Certainly the injury to Andy King in the second half. Now this was an outrageous tackle by Sunderland's Ian Munro. Very lucky to get away with just a caution. Andy King has torn knee ligaments and he'll definitely miss next Saturday's FA Cup quarter-final at Manchester United. Also, there was that disallowed goal by Kevin Sheedy in the first half. It wasn't easy to spot at the time, but we can clear up the confusion now. Watch out for the player on the right-hand side of the screen as the ball comes back to Sheedy there, number 11. David Johnson is clearly in an offside position. But was he interfering with play as Sheedy scored? That's the age-old question that always leads to a difference of opinion. Back. And now we move to the bottom of the first division for Sunderland's battle against Brighton. Now, Sunderland seem to have been pulling themselves clear six games without a defeat, and then that horrendous 6-1 thrashing at Coventry in midweek. So they're right back in the struggle again. Now, against Brighton, then, the pictures from Tyne Tees, commentators Roger Thames, Sunderland are in the white shirts. Fine march. It's a touch. Nab. Ryan now. It won't fall for Robinson. And Ryan really should have done rather better with that header. The defensive marking somewhat awry for Sunderland. Maybe they were concentrating more on Robinson, the obvious target man. But it missed him out, and Ryan's diving header couldn't find the target, and Robinson couldn't catch it. But Nab. Similar defensive tackling approach of Mick Buckley won the possession for Sunderland and they break now through Pickering. Kept it in. Buckley, the nod down. Foster was there though. And calmly played out to Stevens. And releasing Ritchie, who is onside. The chance here for Ritchie if he can control it. Fine save by Turner. Golden chance, though, for Ritchie. Turner reacting so well. Beat the offside track. Didn't really get the control as he would have wanted it, but there was nothing half-hearted about the shot, and Turner parried it well. So the manager's faith repaid already. Jimmy Case with the corner. Short for Gary Stevens. And Ritchie again with a chance. Putting his header just wide. Well, the possession in general may have fallen to Sunderland, but without doubt it's Brighton who've had the more clear-cut scoring chances. Nobody seemed quite certain who was going to go for that one in the Sunderland defence. Uh, Richie got to it first. Nelson is underneath it. Buckley, Cummins, Hinnigan. Nelson's momentary... Lacks of control, the fall for Raoul. And Gatting eventually under pressure, had to concede the corner. 
King giving his defence a bit of a roasting there. Cummins is nearly in. Right on the goal line. Buckley with a corner. A cavalry charge by Sunderland to get to it. West got to it. It's a penalty. Handball there. Mr. Midgley saw it and gave it. The corner came over. I marched. West got the tackle in. The challenge rather. And the handball was in fact by Nelson. So Raul against Mosley. side 1-0 to Sunderland knocking it in the bottom left-hand corner Mosley sent the wrong way Raul taking on Robinson going all the way and Robinson fouling Raul there Sunderland get the free kick uh, Robinson giving the linesman a bit of a lecture and the referee having a word with the linesman John Maxson restored uh, Brighton have this free kick to deal with there's the big three waiting there to run onto the ball Buckley into the middle Hennigan oh so close well Joe Hennigan scored some tremendous goals at the back end of last season when Sunderland were battling for their first division life hasn't got one this season but he came so close then from Buckley's free kick. Hinnigan made up the ground through the middle and his header bounced off the top of Brighton's crossbar. Pickering. West. This is Cummins now. Taking the defence. Tries one. Wide effort and a good save by Mosley. Stan Cummins has got a couple of goals in the last two games. Sharp then moving forward with great determination and really hitting it. And Mosley did well to push that one over. Pickering takes it again. The big men rush in. West Foster again was to it first. What a difference it's made to Sunderland having the tall figure of Colin West there at the front of the attack to aim at. Gatting. Getting again. Don Shanks looking for Ritchie, but Heimarch has it. And Buckley and Raul. He had to wait for the ball to come down, and there's three men back now for Brighton, but Raul still going it alone. Tries one. Oh! Fine shot by Gary Raul. And Mosley responded magnificently. But a fine run by Gary had to wait till he got that ball under control. He then had to turn inside Foster and let one fly. West now. Cummins is in space out wide. Good work by West. He might well be tempted to try one. He has done. Oh, what a goal by Colin West. That really is a superb goal. That was a neat flick for Gary Rowell. Weston Pickering alongside of him. Cummins, that's a good ball. Stan Cummins. Rowell. Rowell again. He's got it that time. Well, that was almost a carbon copy of Colin West's recent goal here against Everton. Rowell came in. Got the first header in, Mosley could only push it back out to him, and Raul followed up his own effort to score his second goal of the game. And a victory that again eases Sunderland's problems. They now move six off the bottom. There's more trouble for Middlesbrough and Wolves, who both lost.